Agriculture Minister vows to rid corrupt practices. Calls for more funding to assist battered women. And Betty's Lodge providing employment at the foot of Mount Willem. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Saturday's news. The Livestock Development Corporation or LDC is not making enough revenue and staff have not been paid for six fortnights. Agriculture and Livestock Minister John Simon made this known when signing an agreement with a private company to import cattle. He said the LDC is in a lot of mess that needs urgent attention and he's committed to fix it. In, you improve it. According to the minister, the Livestock Development Corporation has been making less than 30,000 kina in revenue. That is not enough to pay its staffs, and staffs have been going without pay for over six fortnights. The minister said they are paying over 100,000 kina overhead cost to keep them going, which is more than the revenue they make. And how can LDC continue to operate like this to pay a overhead cost of more than 100,000, close to 100,000, with a wages bill? of about close to 35,000 uh, fortnight, which are 70,000 a month, and LDC is making a revenue of less than 30,000. We've got people sitting up at, uh, most of the LDC peop, uh, employees now, I have not been paid for more than six fortnights, I was told. LDC is a government agency responsible for the development of all forms of livestock, including cattle, pig and sheep, among others, and they have farming facilities throughout the country. However, there seem to be a lot of corrupt practices in the agency. According to the minister, there are payments to ghost names for looking after facilities in other provinces, while less than five staffs are working here at their headquarters. This morning I decided to go and check that office. I said, you ready for me to check the office? Yes. We work done. I walked into the section that is called LDC. Guess what? How many people at work? Five. Less than five. We've got about 14 or 15 people paid and they're in Medellin. We've got it in Goroka people paid. There's no money coming in, but they're paid for looking after property. All right, fain up. The minister further highlighted his plans to address corruption in the agency, adding that there is a need for a thorough audit into the organization. But we're going to do an audit. A thorough audit and just find out what's happening. That's why uh, a lot of people are saying LDC is corrupt, DIL is corrupt. We're not corrupt. We're going to get it fixed. With me right now, we're going to get it fixed. In an effort to save LDC and to generate more revenue, LDC has signed an agreement with Taylor Pacific to import cattles to slaughter and sell. Under this agreement, LDC will be leasing its properties to Taylor Pacific to use. According to the minister, this partnership will help raise more than 50,000 kina every month, which will help meet some of their costs. And there are plans to partner with more companies and lease more of their properties. We're willing to go in partnership with those other um, private companies who are willing to bring livestock into Papua New Guinea. We're opening up the door now. If you want to bring, uh, Papua New Guineans love eating lambs, lamb, lamb plebs, so if you want to bring sheep in, uh, we're opening it up. You can bring it in and slaughter it here. We've got a facility up there. We've got a uh, apple there. We've got land there. We can help you. The minister further called on all development partners, including commodity board CEOs, to work together to help address corruption in the department. And let's move this department forward. Let's not continue to, to fight our, among ourselves. This department is too big. It belongs to the 8 million people of this country. And they, uh, this, uh, the Marabe Davis government is a... Uh, um, you know, they've hanged on this department as the one that will drive this country forward. And we've got to prove that we are mature enough to do this. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. The landing of the Kumul Submarine Cable Network, or KSCN, will start in Vanimo next week. Spearheaded by PNG Dataco, the KSCN is part of a modern domestic and international network that will connect all provincial capitals to the global community with fast, cheap and reliable internet connectivity. So far, the project has progressed well with the successful completion of the cable landing from Sydney, Australia to Port Moresby. The Vanimo Cable Landing is also significant 
important as it will connect PNG to the growing Asian market. The KSCN will connect the southern NGI and Momasa regions with submarine cables, with terrestrial or on-ground cables for the Highlands region. The Vanimo landing will be officially launched next Monday by PNG Datako and the Sundown Provincial Government. There are a growing number of safe houses that provide safe havens for women during times of crisis. The Catholic Church hosts four safe houses, but with limited legal guidance from the Department for Community Development and Religion. The Catholic Bishops' Conference of PNG and Solomon Islands states that this is a gap that needs to be addressed. The Catholic Bishops' Conference of PNG and Solomon Islands have announced the launch of the Catholic Safe House Association. However, there is a rising concern for the government of PNG to come clear on its policies on the repatriation and temporary housing of victims of family and sexual violence who seek safety in informal safe houses. To see this uh, uh, initiative happening right to the, to the people on the ground. Our experience is that many times the government expect the churches to respond to this. Of course, they are our people, we respond to them. But there is also government commitment that needs to be seen uh, that is very proactive. The Catholic Church hosts four safe houses at the moment, but with limited legal guidance from the Department for Community Development and Religion. And that is a gap that needs to be addressed in collaboration with CIMC's Family Sexual Violence Units and existing safe houses. Department Secretary Anna Kavanabai says there are no set legal frameworks, but there are plans to create one. But the Lookout in Pekini um, Act already has some standards there, you know, of, of early childhood learning and safe homes as well. So we're going to look at that and see what we can develop for a whole country, you know, a national framework. At this point in time, we don't have a national framework for that safe home, but we have the policies and legislations of working in partnerships with partners that already have a safe home. The Catholic Safe House Association, basing on current lessons learned, made the following recommendations to the PNG government. Department of Community Development and Religion. Be practical and support registration, uh, repatriation plans of victims of socially related violence and link up with safe houses in PNG. To fast track the repeal of sorcery act and keep up the, with recent trends of violence. Develop a legal framework for safe house management. Child and Family Services Director Simon Yanis, in response to the recommendation, said, We have a safe house and out of home case, it's, uh, it's a partnership arrangement. Yeah, for us as the regulators of um, out of home case, we license them. They require standards that are required to, uh, to have a license. Currently, churches and NGOs take on full responsibility to provide such safe havens for women during crisis. Right now we are talking about safe houses, but we would like to also to, also to see that we are all, in fact, safe people. Men and women, children, youth, we are all safe people. That means we can be trusted. Lillian Soperakinea, National MTV News. The Department for Community Development and Religion has launched their 2020 Media and Communication Strategy. The media section of the ministry will focus on promoting and advocating the district community development centres throughout the country. The strategy will provide a guide to information management, storage and distribution for social protection and empowerment programmes. The department's media and communication strategy is an integral part of the department's work. This year will be the year of implementation as they aim to work closely with the districts through their community development district centers. And therefore the communication strategy will help the department inform and educate. And we are not doing the media and communication strategy for nothing, it's complementing our 
And our annual plan is implementing our five-year corporate plan. We have a five-year corporate plan. At the end of it all, the mission is to improve the quality of life of families in the community. That is the simple vision that we have. The strategy itself is a set guideline to document and promote activities, programs and workshops conducted and initiated by the department together with the legislative frameworks. It provides a guide for advocators and implementers of gender-based violence advocacy, welfare officers and human rights defenders to report on issues in the district. Community Development Minister Wakegoi said the districts need to experience and receive this service. Staffing the how and people are making work on helping more people because you may talk too much or I too much or so many times you may talk to me and people will come to me like how you will bring in my money and all the other services that have been missing from districts or provincial level. People are like bringing closer to the district level so. The department will continue to work within their five-year corporate plan to achieve their five key result areas, with districts being the priority this year. As a department, we not only um, respond to those key areas, we also respond to the overall national plans of the government, the Mission 2050, the Medium and Development Plan. Lilian Soperakinea, National MTV News. Six senior public servants were permanently appointed and signed their employment contracts this week at the Government House. Head of State and Governor General Sir Bob Dadai witnessed the contract signing. Among them is Higher Education Secretary Father Jan Juba, DAL Secretary Daniel Kombuk, Jerry Gary as Managing Director for Mineral Resources Authority and DIRD Secretary Ahi Vaki. Government House was busy this week as it officiated employment contract signing for senior public servants, head of government departments and agencies, among them three department secretaries, Father Jan Zuba, Higher Education Research Science and Technology, Daniel Kombuk as Secretary for Agriculture and Livestock, and Hayi Vaki from the Department for Implementation and Rural Development. For government agencies, Michael Barobe as Chief Executive Officer of Pacific Institute of Leadership and Governance, Jerry Gary as Managing Director of Mineral Resource Authority, and Victor Gabi as Director General of National Institute of Standard and Industrial Technology. The employment contract for the senior public servant is for a period of four years. This week also saw the presentation of credentials by Fiji and Japan. Japan Ambassador Kuniyuki Nakahara was given a period before presenting the letter of credence to Governor General Sir Bob Dadai. The two later shared some moments together and emphasized to strengthen the relationship between PNG and Japan. On a similar note, newly appointed High Commissioner of the Republic of Fiji also presented Fiji's letter of credence. Jack Lepava Jr., National MTV News. Still to come on National MTV News, recipients of the Archer Leadership Program recognized finding employment at the foot of Mount Willem and a mission accomplished for Kumul Force 17. Stay tuned for the details. Welcome back. Seven recipients of the Archer Leadership Program under the Kokoda Track Foundation were recognized by Acting Prime Minister David Stephen and Australian High Commissioner Bruce Davis last night. The program provides sponsorship to assist students in leadership training. Finding and fostering a new generation of strong and passionate leaders, the Archer's Leadership Program is dedicated to social change and an improved future for the nation. And the program has been fostering leadership journeys for the next generation of PNG leaders for the past nine years. Expressing the PNG government's appreciation of the outcome of the program and its efforts in reaching out to Papua New Guineans. It's more than the mateship. It's, it's from a Papua New Guinea point of view, it's really now about the critical help we need from a good friend in a time of need. And in a, in a time of need when right now, we could be talking about how you could help us with our economy and indeed your happiness and all the other areas of our, our country, all, 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 the, all the other sectors. Adding that Australians focus on the next generation is very inspiring. And I'd like to be able to say that on behalf of our country and its leadership tonight, 
thanking you because I know, uh, as well as many of us who, who currently represent our people in parliament, that unless we enter the hopes of this nation in, in the next generation of leaders who are sincere, who are going to be better, better equipped, and better positioned to take this nation forward, all our efforts will have been in vain. So thank you indeed for being able to recognize that, that, that space, that need, and be able to reach out in that way in the ACHA program. The foundation is only one of two non-government organizations associated with Australia that has a full focus on PNG. We're very pleased within the Australian government scene to be able to be a, uh, an ongoing partner. Um, KTF is a member of our, our broader non-government organisation uh, support program and uh, one where each year they're able to be uh, a, a participant and a, a, um, a recipient of finance from, uh, from the, uh, the Australian uh, Development Cooperation Program. Long may that continue. Long may they keep this, this very strong and valuable focus on Papua New Guinea. Adding further that Australia is looking at the many skills that can be gained through education. One of the areas that I think is particularly important uh, education for the future, working on elementary education. There can be nothing more important for the longer term future of Papua New Guinea to have uh, children from a very young age uh, having the very best opportunities for their, uh, for their educational development. So again, I hope uh, engagement in that very, very important element of the whole education field can continue uh, long term. The Archer Leadership Program is on its 10th year of funding and the seven new cohorts will take their year-long experiential journey as Archer Leaders to gain as much network and ability to create the much-needed change. Anit Kora, National MTV News. A cocoa farmers group in the Panguna district of central Bougainville has received a new tractor and solar combination dryer. Nimani Farmers Cooperative Society in the village of Vito in Torao and consists of 22 female and 28 male farmers and was initiated in 2016. The group was successful in gaining a grant in 2017 to expand cocoa production with funding from Australia, New Zealand in partnership with the autonomous Bougainville government and government of Papua New Guinea. Australia and New Zealand have invested more than 8 million kina in grants to 25 cocoa farming groups across the region. The tractor and dryers hope to improve cocoa quality and access better markets. A councillor in the Kambise village of remote Goilala in the central province says excess remains a challenge for local farmers to bring their produce to market. Councillor Ben Willey is calling for help from the responsible government agencies and members of parliament to assist. The village councillor brought his produce to MTV's office front to show what Goilala has to offer. Goilala is dubbed the food hub of central province with its climate suitable for vegetable growth. Yet mode of transportation of produce out of the district is on foot, by road on treacherous conditions or by expensive freight transport. Press the column one one, the, uh, one platen or two, two platen kg or column you know, blow market because he had low Kalimigo low S3 pro Kalima transport him. And me need him because low demas connecting all of water pay, especially inside the water because water pay he hold him the biggest, uh, highest. Uh, resource in several central province. And with the emphasis the Marpe Stephen government has placed on its agricultural intentions as one of its top priorities, local farmers such like Councillor Willie are still having high hopes to remedy their struggle to bring their fresh produce to market at a reasonable cost. We price a Kalimgol or normal market in Abatia, Nasidan or Mili Mama is a Sidan marketing. You know, say, me pay no say go or big plug company or one or supermarket no got. Now, um, first time me plug all consoles, me plug he try best bloom plug or pioneer market outside the market him or products bloom plug. Anit Kora, National MTV News. 
Employment opportunities might be hard to find in villages. However, there is one thing the owner of the Betty's Lodge in Gambog is providing for villagers. Betty Higgins employs over 10 people at her lodge and trout farm at the foot of Mount Willem and hopes to employ more people as her establishment grows. Betty said while most people are now flocking to towns and cities to look for employment, she's doing what little she can to employ locals in the village. Betty Higgins has more than 10 people working here at her establishment in Gembog, Chimbu province. They work at the lodge, fish farm, and some tend to the gardens. However small, Betty says it's about creating work for the people. And we can create work for our own people. Uh, wages may not be big, but at least you are doing something, creating something where uh, people are not going to town looking for work, um, hanging around town, stealing, pickpocketing, all these kind of things. We, it can only be reduced if people go to work. So I, that's what I believe in. And Betty started the fish farm in 1993 and the lodge in 1996. Without any background knowledge in tourism or fish farming, she started both projects, learning on the job. She now trains others who work at the fish farm and lodge. Me plus I must train him all. Some other some must ready now. Customer must you mean must must see customer. One plus customer you mean must see. They go talk talk now plan the more by come. They are currently building a new lodge, which she hopes to open next year, and will employ more people. I will employ a couple more cleaners, couple more cooks. I will prof. I will pay for professional cooks here and they will cook for this place um, so I think at the end of the day I've got I have a vision and my vision is uh, I'm gonna reach that goal Lucy Kopana National NTV News Papua New Guinea Defence Force soldiers, the Kumul 417, are leaving the Victorian town of Omea after helping clear debris from roads in the wake of the bushfire crisis. PNG sent almost 100 Defence Force members who were mostly engineers to help clean up bushfire affected areas. This report from ABC's Hilda Wayne from the ABC's Tokpisin service. It's a classic PNG dish. Sweet potato and taro cooked on hot stones are being served alongside roast pork cooked over a pit. Everyone will definitely enjoy it and you will never forget us. <laughs> Soldiers from PNG have spent weeks clearing roads and shoring up containment lines here in Omeo. And here they're being treated to a traditional feast organized by members of Melbourne's Papua New Guinean community. We are so proud of what um, they've done. It's a really good thing. Um, you know, Papua New Guinea is a small country. The only thing we can do was to help. Australian officials say their work has been essential. They've helped to reconnect isolated communities with schools and services after the blazes ripped through East Gippsland. Uh, we can't thank especially the Papua New Guinea Defence Force enough. Uh, that is a partnership, uh, and not a big brother. It's a true sibling partnership. The soldiers also took time to meet members of the community and they also built a memorial at the school in the nearby town of Swifts Creek. And I think one of the joys that the locals have um, liked the most is the fact that in the evening um, the soldiers often do their devotions or sing um, several hymns and people find it really beautiful to listen to and really relaxing. Papua New Guinea is no stranger to natural disasters. Tsunamis, earthquakes, floods and volcanic eruptions are not uncommon and Australia is often the first to offer help. Taking part in this operation, especially assisting the Australian community, is like a it's like a sort of appreciation showing that you know, at least giving back something, you know, not not big but small in whatever way we can. Especially. With their mission accomplished, the soldiers are now preparing to head home. And the first thing they're going to do when they get there... Have a beer. Among stories making headlines overseas, concerns raised on the health of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange and more than 600 tested positive for coronavirus on board the cruise ship Diamond Princess. Details when we come back.
Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, an Australian delegation has expressed concern about the health of Julian Assange after visiting him in a London prison. They are calling for Assange to be freed as the WikiLeaks founder prepares for his extradition hearing next week. He is wanted in the United States to face 18 charges, including espionage, which carry a maximum of 175 years in prison. Unlikely picture of unity. Political difference fell away as the Australian MPs emerged from Belmarsh Prison with a message. Enough is enough. Uh, leave our bloke alone and let him come home. They spent 90 minutes with Assange, his mental health their greatest concern. I said, I don't mean to be flippant, but how are you doing? And his words were immediately not good. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist. Uh, but it was obviously that there's a man who is under enormous pressure. Uh, clearly his health and mental health has deteriorated. Next week marks the beginning of the next phase for Assange, but it's by no means the end. The extradition starting on Monday is likely to last a number of years. That takes into account the appeals process, and even if he wins, he could still end up in the US. Him, he could still face extradition from any number of other countries. It just protects him from extradition from this country. His lawyers say Assange is still receiving consular assistance, but demand the Australian government does more. There's set to be quite the frenzy outside this court next week because this case will gain huge international attention. Julian Assange will sit in the court on a daily basis, but his legal team won't say yet whether he'll testify. I sense he feels betrayed um, by the Australian government, by the British government, uh, by the US government. And I actually think he's holding it together uh, remarkably well. I think he's a man of, uh, of, of a lot of inner strength. But he'll need more than that if he's to escape the grasp of the US government. It's been a harrowing time for passengers of the Diamond Princess cruise ship docked in Japan. Japanese authorities have been holding the ship under quarantine. More than 600 passengers and crew tested positive for the coronavirus and the first deaths have been reported. Over the past week, many countries have evacuated their citizens from the ship. But for those already infected, there's no easy way home. ABC's Jake Strummer spoke to one Australian couple facing a heart-wrenching situation situation. As busload after busload of people left the ship, Queenslanders Paul and Coralie Williamson got the news they'd been dreading. Paul had tested positive for the coronavirus. Can you see my eyes? They're very small because I've been crying. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Are you, are you okay? How, how are you going, Coralie? No, she's not, she's not going, to, going too well, actually, but we're... Uh... Yeah, we'll just take a step at a time and we'll go from there. I'm an emotional girl, highs, lows. <laughs> <laughs> this latest news has definitely been a low. After two weeks quarantined together in this cabin, now they'll be forced to split up. Paul isn't showing symptoms and by this morning still hadn't been taken off the ship. This is the final day, we assume. Been here a lot longer than we absolutely expected. Coralie will take the Australian government's evacuation flight to Darwin and Paul will go to hospital somewhere in Japan. I've got my bag ready for uh, departure to the hospital at some stage today. The 14 days quarantine for those on board finished today. But there are doubts as to how effective it's been. This was much more preferable, obviously, at the time than necessarily having everyone disperse uh, around the world. But obviously the situation on the ground has changed and clearly there's been more transmission than expected on the ship. 500 passengers aged 70 or over who tested negative were allowed off. The rest will be released over the next few days. But there are still questions about how and when all all remaining passengers will be able to go home. In the United States, one of the world's richest men, Michael Bloomberg, has been savaged by his rivals after surging into contention for the Democratic Party's nomination to take on Donald Trump at November's election. The billionaire appeared in his first national televised debate, claiming he's the only person with the resources to boot the polarizing U.S. president out of the White House.
The Democratic Party's many debates have often resembled a reality TV show. Over the past eight months, unpopular candidates have steadily been booted off stage. And today, a surprise intruder worth more money than almost anyone else on the planet was suddenly thrust into the mix. And I'm spending that money to get rid of Donald Trump, the worst president we have ever had. And if I can get that done, it will be a great contribution to America and to my kids. Michael Bloomberg's appearance made this debate a political version of Survivor. He was furiously attacked from all sides over his record on race relations. I've sat, I've apologised, I've asked for forgiveness. And stumbled badly after being criticised for alleged comments about women. I'd like to talk about who we're running against. A billionaire who calls women fat broads and horse-faced lesbians. And no, I'm not talking about Donald Trump, I'm talking about Mayor Bloomberg. The billionaire got on stage thanks to an unprecedented $600 million TV advertising blitz, which has seen him soar from the back of the pack to as high as second in the polls. Mike Bloomberg for president. He made his vast fortune through a financial information and media company, was New York's mayor for 12 years as a Republican, then an independent, and since leaving office has donated enormous sums of money to push climate change policies and encourage gun control. But in this White House race, previous positions and even policy are playing a very small role. Most Democratic voters are simply desperate to endorse anyone who can defeat Donald Trump. All left this arena bloodied and bruised, though a 78-year-old senator remains the man to beat. Bernie Sanders is more than able to deal with the stress and the vigour of being President of the United States. Donald Trump will again probably be pleased. It's going to take a lot to bring the Democrats back together, no matter who eventually wins the party's nomination. Up next, some sporting updates in Chukai Sports. Don't go away. Chukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. To the OFC Champions League Group A results now and the third and final match day for New Zealand's eastern suburbs and New Caledonia's Yengen Sports saw the New Zealand side coming away with a massive 4-0 victory, bumping them up to top of the ladder. With the aim of finishing this leg of their campaign on a high, the eastern suburbs made their intentions known in the opening 12 with the first goal through Martin Bueno. The next three followed leaving defending champions Yengen sport to st too stunned to respond. Full time and even extra time saw withered spirits from the French speaking side. This is where they bow out while their opponents advance to the knockouts. After a successful time here in Papua New Guinea, Joe Grimmer, the Elite Pathways and Coaching Director for the Parramatta Eels, is back in the country this time to help out with PNG coaches in the Digital Cup. Grimmer did express satisfaction about his last trip to PNG, where he helped coach Michael Marum and the PNG LNG Kumuls to a historical win against the touring British Lions. Joe Grimmer is the elite pathways and coaching director for the Parramatta Eels in the National Rugby League, NRL. He was here last year to help the Kumuls coach Michael Marum prepare the Kumuls to take on the British Lions. This time, upon request by Michael Marum, he was here to talk to Digicel Cup coaches during the coaching conference held this week. I've been invited over to, uh, to come over and um, um, deliver some experience and share some of my experiences with um, some of the Digicel coaches at the coaching conference. So, really fortunate to be here. It's great to be back. The last time we were here, we had some amazing time. So, just to share my knowledge and just to assist them to um, get to their coaching to that next level. He was impressed with the performance by the Kumuls and the Orchids last year, describing the players as passionate about being in the national team. I think that just justifies rugby league in PNG. Um, it doesn't matter um, the opposition that you put uh, in front of uh, the Kumuls and even the Orchids, given that the, uh, the female uh, English team, the Great Britain team and the Lions are top three in the world. The fact that we came out here in front of that amazing crowd, the players pulled on that jersey and 
they turned into superhuman beings. He has only heard about the passion of the players in the national side before coming here to Papua New Guinea, but when he experienced it and was part of it, he came to understand it. My feeling is that I always knew about the passion in PNG, but I didn't understand the true uh, meaning of that until I experienced it last time. Um, some of the players who played for PNG at best were playing Canterbury Cup and in the ISP, but they rose to that occasion. He added that coach Michael Marum's approach to the team has had a positive impact on the players' performance. I really feel that what coach Mike Murram is doing at the moment um, and the inclusiveness and the understanding of the direction of the Gummels and the Orchids um, resonates with the players. They really know what their role is for this country, not just for the Gummels but for the country and what it means. Grimmer is excited about the future prospects of the two national teams, both the men's and the women's, after their stunning performance in the two matches against the British Lions and the England Roses. Part of that, and uh, having only been involved in PNG for six months, it's given me a uh, um, inner sanctum look uh, and a feel about what it's like to be uh, a PNG. Um, I'm the height of a Papuan, but I'm not fully PNG yet. But um, I can only hope over the next um, 18, 24 months, leading into the 2021 World Cup, is there's going to be some special moments on the horizon. And the Great Britain Test is just one of those special moments um, and many more yet to come. Fidel Sukina National MTV Sports. Chuka Sports continues after the break with hockey at home and rugby abroad where Israel Folau makes his debut in France. Stay tuned for the details. True Kai Sports. Welcome back to True Kai Sports. Island Divas, an all female hockey team, recently received their new jerseys from the number one trophy limited under their mint brand. The team was established to take part in international hockey tournaments. Island Divas hockey team is a new team made up of women who enjoy the sport of hockey. Their main aim is to have a hockey team to take part in international tournaments. The number one trophy limited under their mint brand supplied the women with new uniforms for the team recently and committed to helping the team in their preparations towards future tournaments. Manager of number one trophy limited special projects, Yolanda Gui, said number one trophy limited is very happy to sponsor the team island divas with their uniforms because this is a new sponsorship with them we won't stop there so we are supportive of the team with whatever uh, challenges they may face as they've mentioned they're still doing fundraising so whatever fundraising they're they're doing this year leading up to their competition we're happy to support in any way we can um, i mean they're wearing our brand so uh, we're here for them the club president Lucy Francis was appreciative of the gesture by Number One Trophy Limited and explained the team's purpose. Um, we are actually a, a new club, a new team, and we formed this team mainly to take part in um, like master events that are held internationally. Um, we have um, girls who play in the Port Mosby Hockey Association, so we just got a couple of girls together who are 30 years old and plus to be in this. Um, the first event that we're going to go to is the Pan Pacific. It's in November this year. So The Mint brand continues to support sports and with the upcoming Hevea Cup in March, Mint will also be putting its support behind the competition. Supported other activities in the past. Um, there is one of them, um, a profile event that's happening early in March. So I'm not too sure if you've heard of the Hevea Cup. So Hevea International Rugby, the, the women's rugby nines. So Mint is getting behind that as well. So we will be there for the next uh, three days from the 5th to the 7th. Um, so that's one of the initiatives we're taking part in. Fidelis Sukina National MTV Sports. Sacked Australian rugby international Israel Folau has played his first match for French rugby team the Catalan Dragons under intense scrutiny. The controversial player made the move to France after he was dropped by Rugby Australia over his controversial social media comments. It was a Super League debut many didn't want to see. But it couldn't be stopped and nor could Folau. 
Titans' first touch of the ball just six minutes into play, Israel Folau proved his worth on the field. Time and again, the French team played to his strength with the high balls. For him to play his first game of rugby league and you know, to come up with that sort of defensive performance um, really gives us encouragement going forward with him. Helping his team to a 36-18 victory, Falau started and stayed for the entire 80 minutes with his wife Maria watching on from the stand. The Catalans' dragons remain unapologetic for the signing. When I go to sign a player, I'm talking from a football perspective. He will not repeat anything that was said. Whether you like that or don't like it, whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, we quite clearly do not agree with it. We've said that, but that's it. The local fans rolled into the ground to watch the debut and cared little about past indiscretions. I think it's good for the club and good for rugby league. He speak, he say, you like or not like. Here, it's just for a player. His debut might be done, but the controversy still lingers and away from French soil, he'll face far more hostile crowds. The Wigan Warriors have already said they'll host a pride match when they take on the team in March. A Catalan spokesman denied two women in the French crowd had their rainbow flags removed. The Dragons hope moving forward for Lau's league does the talking. But can he remain silent for the next 12 months? And that ends Chukai Sports. The weather details coming up next. Chukai Sports. True Kai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast in the southern region. Fine weather in Port Moresby. Partly cloudy with rain drizzles in Daru. Karama and Alutau, rain and thunderstorms in Popandita. In the Mamasi region, showers in Wau, a shower or two in Lei, cloudy with some showers later in Lei. And fine, although cloudy in Wewak and Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, fine weather in Larangau, fine although cloudy at times in Kaviang. Thundery showers in Kokopo and Rabao, cloudy with some afternoon showers in Kimbe and Boka. And in the Highlands region, light drizzles, then morning fog right across the region in Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabag. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus, with you always. And that's the way it is this Saturday, the 22nd of February 2020. From the entire news team, pleasant viewing. Good night. <laughs>